This is the DMT One to One Show, episode 29, recorded on the 3rd and 4th of October 2013. A special from the Hardworking Class Heroes Festival in Dublin, featuring interviews with the hype machine, maker, emeralds, and music. And this week's show is sponsored by media law firm Sheridans at sheridans.co.uk. It's uh, great to be here at the Hardworking Class Heroes event in Dublin, and uh, I'm here at this uh, late hour. Well, it's only 7 p.m., but it's uh, pretty late after a full day with uh, Dev Sherlock uh, from the Hive Machine. So, hi, Dev, and thanks for joining me. How's it going today? Good, thanks. Good. It's great. I really wanted to chat with you about uh, the Hive Machine and so and what you guys are up to at the moment. So, uh, first of all, you know, I've been to uh, a number of uh, panels in the last year that talk about the evolution of music blogging. Uh, mm. Uh, especially due to uh, the way people are discovering music and different services coming into play. And so have you seen uh, an, an evolution in this field over the past couple of years and the way music bloggers uh, approach uh, uh, the way they, they curate and, and put the, the selections that they do out there? I think the two biggest changes I've seen are probably the format, because it used to be all about MP3 downloads, right? And now SoundCloud seems to have taken over and Bandcamp and that sort of thing. And everyone seems to be content with having a stream of a song and hearing that. Um, and then ideally, that you know, they go and buy it or, or something like that. But the whole idea that it had to be an MP3 and you had to be able to download it, and these were all MP3 sites, that's kind of gone by the wayside. Yeah. So that's the one big change. The other big one for me is that blo there's a, a new mentality. The new generation of bloggers have this mentality of... I think it all started when Stereo Gum was purchased for a large amount of what was considered a large amount of money. Um, all of a sudden, blogs saw this between Stereo Gum and what Pitchfork was doing. I think blogs saw this as a real business opportunity. A lot of people came into it for reasons that you know I could build this great online web magazine or you know news outlet, and I'm going to cover everything and be the be all end all. Yeah. Whereas before. Blogs were more about the personality of that particular blogger right. and what they liked and who they were as a, as a person and their musical tastes and that sort of thing. So it went from being, you know, your buddy next door that made you mixtapes to all of a sudden we're almost a corporate minded outlet. Yeah, it becomes a professional journalist position essentially. Right, Ish. right. Yeah. But, but, but not professional journalists yeah, in exactly. many cases. Yeah, sure, sure, and, sure. and that's fine if it's one person and just their passion about the music. Yeah. But if you're trying to be something like a Pitchfork or even a Rollingstone.com or whatever some of these blogs are trying to be, that feels a little bit more, I don't know, it's just, it's just a different mindset. Yeah. You, know, you have these two different mindsets now from blogs. You still have that personal guy doing it as his hobby, and then you have other people that are doing it as a potential business. Yeah, sure. And uh, looking at how the artists are approaching as well, the uh, uh, looking at approaching blogs, uh, I think you know a lot of artists uh, I know are using the Hive Machine as a way also to find the blogs that might be interesting for them. So is that is that the case? And uh, are they more educated now, artists into using uh, tools like, like yours to, to find the right blogs to approach and to make sure that they are the people that might like their music? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think that's one of the smartest things you can do as a band is you do need to target. You can't just send a blanket email anymore. So I think a lot of blogs are going and searching bands that are similar to them and finding blogs that are writing about those bands and then yeah. maybe targeting those blogs. And you have to target blogs too. You can't just send, like I said, a blanket email anymore. You have to say, you know, I've noticed you've written about this band and that band and I think you'd like my band. You, know, you have to show that you've been to the site and you're offering them something you think yeah. <laughs> you know is of value um, and, it's, and now it's curated for them in the sense that you know uh, that they can find a lot of the blogs that are covering music on the hat machine and they don't have to to search madly through thousands and thousands of web pages searches so that's that's already half the job done for them really <laughs> that's true and the other advantage is that blogs are a lot more accessible to artists yeah and Meanwhile, all the people that they want to reach ultimately, A&R people, publishers, music sync people, uh, club bookers, all these sorts of industry people are using the hype machine yeah. as their sort of shortcut, uh, you know, easy resource. So if these artists are getting attention from blogs, you're inevitably going to get attention from all these industry people that are using the hype machine. Whereas typically it'd be a lot harder to get a publisher on the phone or get an A&R guy to listen to your soundcloud or your cd demo or whatever yeah sure and uh, looking at uh, some of the work you do at the hive machine you also look at the hype hotel uh, initiatives uh, so uh, which is uh, all, all about live uh, really uh, so mm -hmm. looking at that side of things uh, it's very interesting i've been to 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 twice uh, at south by uh, but that's the only time i really experienced it how how does a web uh, a, a company like the hype machine 
uh, relate to a live audience because of course it's all based online and uh, online and uh, what happens when you bring that to the real world the goal with hype hotel is literally to bring the hype machine experience to real life so we try to book the artists that are getting a lot of attention on the hype machine or that we yeah. really like or that you know blogs that we work with really like because we partner with blogs and let them help us pick bands and stuff yeah. um and that's it really and so how, how many events do you do these days uh, on, on that front? Well, for Hype Hotel this year, I think altogether we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 65 artists and DJs, all, all told, across the week. That's awesome. That's yeah, cool. yeah, it was fun. A lot of work, but it was fun. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's definitely uh, worth going to again next year. If you're heading to South by Southwest, uh, Hype Hotel is one of the highlights uh, of, uh, of the week. Uh, and, uh, well, it's, uh, it's great. And, uh, of, of course, I would encourage people to go and check out HypeM.com and the Hype Machine Spotify app uh, as well. Uh, if yeah, you have we're that on Spotify live. now. Yeah. We're on Sonos now. Um, you have your own app too? We do. Uh, yeah. Yep. And that's on iPhone, Android. It's uh, really nice. That's cool. Awesome. Yeah, really so nice. it's, uh, it's great. And uh, hypem.com, thanks so much, Daph, for your time. Thanks. We're here at Howard Working Class Years 2013, and I'm here with uh, Tom Connerty, uh, from uh, founder of uh, uh, Underscore Maker. So hi, Tom, and good to have you on. How's it going? Yeah, good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So what is, uh, uh, how, how do you call it? Do you call it Underscore Maker, or uh, what's the best way to, to, to say it? Uh, we just say Maker. Okay, great. Awesome. Yeah. The idea being that, you know, uh, the underscore is, is preceding what you could be. You, know, so you could be a synth maker, or a guitar pedal maker, or, or anything, really. You know? Yeah, that's great. And so uh, what is the company? What, what do you guys do? Uh, so we teach DIY audio electronics. Um, at the moment, we're running workshops in Ireland and in London, making guitar pedals, synths, and amplifiers. And we're in the process of developing an online learning platform for uh, DIY audio electronics. So we'll have videos showing you how to build different kits. But the, the real special thing about our, our platform is that for each video showing you how to build a kit, we'll have five videos explaining the electronics involved, how you can mod it, how you can make it your own. That, that's our real goal, is to, is, to, is to show musicians that you know, there's, there's real creative potential in building your own electronics. Yeah, and that's really cool because on the one side it unleashes a creative potential that is uh, otherwise left to sort of untapped and on the other side it also reduces costs for the musician because we all know how expensive even the most uh, inconsequential lead can be or, or small repairs or something. And so, so those are both things that you're tackling with the workshops, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a huge amount of money to be saved. I mean, it, you can make very small adjustments to circuits to create wildly different sounds, you know. A couple of cents for a different diode or, or, or a different capacitor, you know, and you've got a whole new, uh, a whole new effect or instrument, you know. That's really awesome. Uh, I love it. And, and you know, I've, I've been going to Music Hack Days uh, for uh, maybe four or five years now since they, since they started really in, in London. And uh, uh, there's, there's, there's still not enough hardware hacks there's a lot of software hacks yeah. but I'd love to see more of that kind of stuff happening and, and I think people are sometimes scared to do to do it I mean I I was looking at for example for the show I was looking at uh, uh, modifying uh, um, uh, iRig uh, converter box uh, to help me uh, do an input into the into this DSLR that I'm using right now uh, to allow me to use a, a dynamic mic and use the iRig uh, to to get the signal in there and swap the cable around. But the instructions uh, were talking about doing some soldering, but I've never done soldering before, so I was terrified of actually getting the gear and trying to do it by myself because I wasn't sure what was going to happen really, and then I could have probably ruined the piece of kit uh, altogether. So, so do you find that's the same thing for musicians that they kind of know all this stuff is out there and they, they can probably find a YouTube video to tell them how to do it, but until they actually have the tools in their hands with somebody telling them how to, how to use them, it's pretty difficult to, to work out. I think there's a really big fear yeah. when it comes to soldering and it's, it's honestly completely unfounded. There's nothing to be afraid <laughs> about when it comes to soldering. In our workshops, we always start with 10, 15 minutes worth of soldering practice and yeah. without fail, guaranteed everyone can do it after that you know and I think once you get past that first hurdle of being able to solder it just opens up a whole world of possibilities for you you know and um, a big problem for audio um, D or DIY audio is that uh, there's really no focal point for information on that right. you know if you want to learn something or maybe there's one hack out there or or one kit here or there there's nowhere really central going well this is what you need to learn to be able to develop your skills to to, to, to start to build on, on what you want to do, you know. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing with the platform, bringing everything together, all the basic skills from right from your very first solder 
all the way up to modifying synths, things like that, you know. That's great. And uh, you were talking about the fact that you are also coming down to London uh, from Dublin to do a workshop there. So yeah. just for the benefit of the listeners that are from London, uh, w w when's that going to happen? Okay, yes. Yeah, so we're going to be running our first workshop uh, on the 9th of November in Cable Studios, which I believe is in Limehouse. And uh, we're running three workshops that day. There's the uh, the general introduction to DIY electronics, um, where we'll cover soldering the components. We'll do some prototyping, and then we finish by building a small pocket amplifier. Yeah. And then in the afternoon we have a synth building workshop, a little light uh, synth. You sort of play like a theremin. Yeah. Uh, it's great fun. Yeah, great fun. <laughs> and then also we'll have a fuzz pedal making workshop. Great. Yeah. That's awesome. That's fantastic. And uh, again, what is the website where people can go and refer to have a look at uh, what you guys are doing? Yeah, so it's just maker, M A K E R dot IE. That's a good domain. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much and uh, uh, have a great rest of the festival. Uh, thanks so much, Andrew. Thanks. Great, I'm here at the Hard Working Class Heroes uh, event in Dublin, and I'm here with Stephen Bratt, uh, CEO and founder of company uh, Emeraz. So hi Stephen, great to have you on, how's it going? Yeah, very good, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to have you, and so uh, talk us through what Emeraz is and what the site does. Yeah, sure. Well, essentially what the, the platform is, is it, it's designed to centralize the um, creation and promotion, distribution and enjoyment of music. So pretty much everything a musician or emerging musician would need Everything is um, you know, right there at your fingertips. Yeah. So the, the platform is, is quite extensive. We, we, we're pretty sure it's the world's most comprehensive music platform. So it covers you from everything from the creation of music the whole way to getting it to your, your audience. Yeah. Um, so it's qu quite, a, quite a large platform. So work Absolutely. Yeah. It's, quite, it's, quite, it's quite complex and uh, uh, looking at it, uh, I, it kind of reminded me of a tweet that I saw the other day where somebody said uh, there isn't a LinkedIn for musicians yet. Uh, and so is this something that, that you're looking towards as, as a potential goal? Absolutely. And in fact, it's funny, funny you say that because that's when we kind of introduce it to people for the first time that may not be in the circles of music. Uh, that's how we say it. We say it's, it's, it's a LinkedIn for music, um, for people in the music business. And we kind of think people also ask, well, how do you distribute or how do you connect with people um, with your music if it's just LinkedIn? So we kind of think, well, it's LinkedIn, but SoundCloud is built onto the side of it. So it's those two things together. And that's exactly what we're aiming for. It's a professional social network designed and dedicated to emerging artists. Yeah, and so let's look at some of the tools, uh, the key tools that you feel are really making the difference uh, for musicians on, on your site. But what would you define as, say, the key three things that you do that are, are really great for musicians? Yeah, well, sure. I mean, first and foremost is the, the profile. So it's a way for an artist to show off what they do and, and, and how they do it. It's who they are as a creative person within the music business, essentially. Um, Within that, then you can say you can tag your creative work. So not only just uploading your songs, your albums, your photos, your videos, you know, the regular things you expect to find on a type of website like this, but it's also, you know, the projects that you've been working on, the things that, that are uh, you know, the future of the music that you're doing right now. Um, but also tagging a musician so that you're a session violin player and you say you wanted to, uh, you know, show off your portfolio. If you give credit where credit is due and every time somebody is, um, is uploading a song and they tag that person that did every part of their track. You know, it gives the, the likes of recording studios, session violin players, and you name it, everybody that uh, should be getting credit for their work on a creative piece of, uh, um, of music, that that, that is actually uh, shown as a part of their portfolio. Right. So that'll be the one, one kind of main area where it gives artists the, the ability to show off what they do. The next one then is the collaboration side and the networking. So, you know, within, within music and within any business, really, it's about developing your connections and developing and building your re re relationships. Um, so we make it quite easy for the networking, like the LinkedIn side of things. But we've also got a collaborative platform built onto the, the site as well. So you can literally create a project, tell people that you're looking for guitar, drums, bass, whatever it is that you need. People can join it. It can be set to private or, pro or um, or public, um, and once they join it, then they can upload anything from a WAV file the whole way to, uh, say, um, uh, a PDF for the lyrics or a MIDI file even. And so all that content is stored there. And then there's ways to prove that you've got the copyright of it to keep everybody protected and everybody safe. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how we work the, the whole collaboration and the networking side of things. And then lastly, we have a kind of a cool thing, which we think is kind of revolutionizing the, the way that people discover uh, emerging bands. And we call it the wall of sound. And essentially, it's a you, when you upload a new song, it goes to the new wall. And 
based on your social engagement, then it goes from the new wall to the to the trending wall. And right. then from there, you get more social engagement and it goes from trending and goes to the hot wall. And from the hot wall, basically, these are the, the organically filtered material that's been on the site. Uh, no advertisements there. So, you know, the people that are there deserve to be there and they yeah. deserve to get the recognition from it. So we believe that this will actually help to, to get artists to a larger audience by introducing it to, you know, the network of their friends and families and their friends and friends and friends and go from there and then how we just keep all this in, in check is we give them that LinkedIn or that Facebook style social network where you've got the feed and the feed then just relays back everything that happens in all of these different areas of the website yeah. just keep it all centralized and keep it all in the one place yeah and then let's look at the roadmap for you guys uh, well, where are you now and uh, where do you hope to be in a year's time for example yeah sure well we just we've launched about a, about a year ago small budget but we we managed to get it out there um, so we're about 11,000 members at the moment um, then within we're in the process of you know raising some capital at the moment to make sure that we can continue on at the rate that we want to but we we hope that by the time this time next year we'd be kind of in and around the hundred thousand members uh needless to say to ramp up our marketing and to, to make sure that we can connect with as many emerging artists as possible but a hundred thousand is where we'd love to be that's great that's awesome well uh go and check out uh it's uh emeraza e-m-e-r-a-z dot com and it's definitely worth uh, checking out if you're interested interested in the idea thanks so much Stephen, and i hope you have a great rest of the festival thank you very much thanks for the, the opportunity It's a real pleasure to be here at the Hardworking Class Heroes Festival uh, with uh, uh, Philip Ganem, who's a Published Relations Manager, and uh, Joseph uh, Benguira, who's a Chief Technical Officer at uh, USEC. So uh, hi, guys, and thanks for joining me. How's it going today? Fine, fine. fine. Uh, we're very happy to be here, actually, <laughs> and very happy to be in Ireland. So Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. Uh, it's not a bad place to be. We had a, uh, quite a bit of fun last night at the various gigs that were happening around town. And uh, so uh, let's start with uh, the basics. Uh, what is uh, USEC and what does the service do? Okay, so Music is uh, uh, the largest uh, free music catalog on the web. Uh, we are trying to service uh, everybody with music and uh, we are uh, available on all the major platforms. Uh, we have um, around 30 million songs available uh, for you people to browse and uh, we have nearly 1 million artists available also. Uh, music is... Um, serving 5 million songs uh, a month to 500, half a million sorry, uh, visitors, yeah. so, which is uh, a growing number at the moment. Um, so That's cool. And, and so uh, what are your sources at the moment for music? Of course, uh, uh, you're talking about a free cat catalog, and yeah. so wh wh right where does music come are, from? We are pulling the content from YouTube, SoundCloud, XFM, and also cloud providers like Dropbox, SkyDrive, and Google Drive. And we're going to add more more data sources like Bandcamp, Jamendo, and a lot more to come. That's great. And so uh, you're talking about the user base at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, where, where do you start developing your user base and where is it based at the moment mostly? It's actually all over the world uh, because music is available completely in... Sorry, music is available anywhere in the world. So um, we have people from the US, we have people in Asia, we have uh, uh, people uh, in Europe, obviously. Yeah. Uh, we are a French-based company, so that's why. Uh, but there's absolutely no limitation uh, in time uh, in uh, time or uh, location. So you can access music from anywhere in the world. And most users come from the, the US, yeah. about 20%. Oh, that's cool. And all the rest is uh, split uh, over the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's interesting. And so looking at uh, the aspects of that that really want, like the way you want to stand out from services that might do uh, similar things. Mm -hmm. So w what are the really, you know, the really important features that you feel uh, differentiate music from other services? Um, I think music uh, allows you to get all the music that you want in the same place yeah. from all the different sources that you can actually have. Uh, so as you said, YouTube and uh, XFM and so on. But you can also have your MP3s in your the same place, yeah. uh, your own file. So um, it really is a kind of a, <coughs> sorry, a kind of a hub for your whole yeah. music. Uh, and it's free and it's 
completely appealing to nearly 98% of uh, the internet users uh, because as everybody knows uh, it's really hard for young people uh, to actually pay for music or pay for anything else in the w- uh, on the web yeah. so yeah absolutely and looking at the, the, the discovery side of things how do you uh, how did you look at that in terms of how do you sort the information you get I from your users it's a very important feature the discover part of music because uh, we are um, merging data from Last.fm and Music Brains and other data source to uh, be able to construct this uh, Discover section on the website. Okay. And so. it's a great way to actually uh, push artists to the, to the users uh, because we are not trying... Uh, you don't have to know the artist to actually get it on music. We, we are proposing you new stuff and new music and stuff like that. That's uh, actually a very big function of uh, music. It uh, allows uh, artists to be discovered and it allows also users to discover artists they would actually never um, look into or something like that. So. Yeah, sure. And, and uh, finally, the, the usual question I ask is on, on the monetization front. Uh, mm-hmm. Is it, uh, of course, it's a user-based play on, on this type of content. I'm yeah. thinking advertising. Is, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we have uh, some advertisement on the website, but uh, we are trying to make it not intrusive. Yeah. So you can uh, play music. You will never be interrupted by an ad or something like that. Uh, so it's completely, uh, sorry, it's completely um, painless for the users, I would say. Uh, we also have some unique features on music, like the music rooms, cool. which is a place where everyone can uh, talk and trade songs about one subject, for example, mm-hmm. US rap or I don't know. Uh, we also have a chat inside the app. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, when, when your friends one. are online, you can uh, drag and drop a song to a friend directly Great. and they can play it or add it to a playlist. Um, we are also working on um, 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 the auction a, a system. U- Sorry, an auction system. An auction, yeah, an auction system to allow artists to uh, gain more fans in a selected country Yeah. so they can for example, say, I want more fans in Canada. And the they will be able to actually target uh, uh, their users uh, by genre, by country, by popularity and stuff like that. So uh, they will be able to actually say, I want uh, the population from 13 years old to 25 years old in yeah. the US market and so on. Cool. And they will be able to target those specific uh, users. And it's going to be also a way for young artists or unknown artists uh, to be discovered i would say yeah. and uh, to be put in front of the people actually yeah. Yeah, cool that's awesome well uh, thank you so much for your time and it's uh you. uh Yuzek, uh, i'll spell it for the viewers and listeners of the show it's uh, y-o-u-z-e-k dot com and uh, go and check it out and uh, and uh, take it for a spin and thanks so much for your time thank you very much and now to finish the show, a short information piece recorded with this week's sponsor of DMT, media law firm Sheridan's. I'm here with uh, Tahir Bashir and we continue our series of segments on digital service providers. Uh, hi Tahir and thanks for being on. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, so uh, today uh, we're going to talk about uh, the relationship between uh, DSPs and, uh, and the prospective you know, uh, uh, content providers and rights holders. So how... Uh, is uh, how important is it to actually understand who the right person to talk to is within an organization and and what's the best way to do that for for a startup that wants to make a deal with say Warner or Universal? Uh, It's crucially important I mean I remember when I uh, uh, acted for um, uh, one of the startups that we ended up selling so it wasn't a startup by the time we sold it that it took us a year when we first did it to find the right person within the label and once we'd found them things started moving much quicker so ultimately you need to be dealing with the right people Um, what is the best way to do that obviously do your research uh, ask around use lawyers that have have dealt with them because they have a hotline into them and um, they they know who basically makes the decisions and who to deal with but but if you're not talking to the right person you're banging your head against a brick wall absolutely and uh, there's a bit of a cultural difference actually between the US and the UK I've I've dealt with uh, companies on both sides of the Atlantic and and so what's the best way to because I know in the the States it's very much a personable approach and you know you actually end up you know becoming friends with some of these people and go for dinner 
dinner with them or, or, or having a barbecue. Yeah. In the UK, it's a little bit more complex because the relationships don't build quite as quickly. So, so what's the recommendation to find the right person within an organization and actually build a really great relationship so that they can advocate for your company within uh, their own? Yeah, I mean, that is actually the key, is if you can, if you can find people that effectively become champions of your service from within. So they really like your service so that we're, when they're in their decision-making role, um, you know, they, they advocate it. That's the key. Uh, that's the key outside of digital service providers anyway. Um, how do you do that? Um, you have, you know, ultimately it comes down to time. You need to try and spend time with people. So, um, you know, uh, do the barbecues here. Obviously, if you can do that, that's great. Uh, but ultimately, the way it works, I guess, is uh, going to events, uh, meeting people, following up, going for coffees, going for lunches, um, but just getting to know someone and understanding their culture and what, what what's important to them and being able to show them that your solution deals with those issues. Yeah. And finally, looking at uh, how... Uh, you can help uh, yourself uh, getting to these people. Uh, how important is it to uh, hire the right people within your own organization as a, as a startup uh, in order to ensure that perhaps you hire somebody that already has some relationships built up? And, and why do you find those people? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not just startups we're talking about here. I mean, ultimately, course, yeah. you know, there's different levels of service provider. You start up, and then actually in the music industry with digital service providers, you, you need to scale up relatively quickly because uh, time ticks away, you've got short-term <laughs> deals, so you need to make sure you're using those those rights so um, finding the right type of people is crucial first of all they need to have the skill set to deal with uh, understanding uh, you know, at the business development level the rights that, that, that we're talking about so quite often what happens is um, the digital service provider will actually look at the, the rights owners themselves and look at people within those organizations and hire them yeah. I mean if you almost look at you know uh, the PRS half of them go on to private uh, um, DSPs similarly at labels they kind of switch, switch sides. I can name, uh, you know, uh, many of the digital service providers, the number of people that have come from labels or collection societies or publishers. So, um, yeah, so uh, it's a very common practice to uh, hire people that have done it before. Great. Awesome. Thank you very much. And until the next segment, thank you. Thanks for listening to the DMT One to One show. And remember to check out digitalmusictrends.com for our weekly news show.